This is a video series on quail management and ties in the latest and largest quail research study in Missouri. This is the second video in a series of three, so if you haven't watched the first video on nesting and brood rearing, you might want to check it out first. I'll be talking with Missouri Department of Conservation's Kyle Hedges about quail habitat outside of nesting and brood rearing season and specifics on how to build it. Also, we will discuss ways to maximize the usable space for quail to get the greatest numbers. We'll be joining Kyle in one of our savannas that we have restored. While quail don't require savanna habitat, it is ideal in many ways. Join Kyle and me as we dive into discussing winter habitat. So Kyle, we've been talking about nesting and brood rearing habitat, but what about the rest of the year? Yeah, so you know the rest of the year, the fall, they're going to transition into that that more woody cover component. That becomes one of the critical factors. We looked out in the nesting brood rearing habitat how certain herbaceous plants can be a surrogate for that thermal cover. They can provide shade, but there is no substitute for hard woody cover throughout the winter. That's one of the necessities. So here in Missouri, um, March is a really tough time. That's our raptor migration going back north. And they really, they're, they're starting to Coveys are starting to move around and they're starting to split up and pairing starts. They really need adequate thickets for that overhead cover. Our hawk populations are at the highest on the return migration. Sometimes they stall out and we saw really high mortalities during those, those migrations back north. So yeah, thickets become imperative that time of year that they can take refuge from those raptors. We're here in one of these savanna restorations that we've done. How does this work for quail habitat? A lot of research out of Oklahoma uh, regarding uh, quail use of, of savanna type areas and you got to get the basal area down around 40. So canopy coverage, I mean it's fairly open, you see a lot of sunlight in here, but probably no more than 30-40% canopy coverage uh, to get enough herbaceous response to get full occupancy of quail. Um, the nice thing about this, so uh, there's just enough shading that even on normal rainfall years you don't tend to get as rank vegetation in these units as you do in a grassland, right? Um, still can get too thick if we don't watch it, but typically the soils in a, in a savanna are a little thinner than some of the grassland units, so, and you'd have just enough shade that we don't get as thick a vegetation, so the disturbance can be a longer interval between disturbances and or a, a less heavy stocking rate if we're using grazing or less uh, frequent fires and still get the same usability out of a lot of the savanna units. So there's several ways we can get um, woody cover for, for quail. Um, obviously native shrub thickets are, are ideal um, because we don't have to plant them each year. We don't have to worry about, um, you know, where am I going to have my woody cover this year or next year? They're always there. Um, certain shrubs do better than others as far as staying put. Uh, gray dogwoods, for example, they tend to get a little wild and want to spread and some people don't like that. They don't stay put. Uh, plums, perfect. They tend to stay in a thicket. They don't really take over. Wing sumac can be a nice thicket, but it can really spread and, and try to take over. Um, aromatic sumac. Um, there's lots of different ones. It depends on where you're at in the landscape. So here's a nice example of a native shrub. This is aromatic sumac. So see how it bushes out, makes a, a wide top. That's going to provide this overhead coverage so that hawks and predators from above won't be able to get to birds that are that are loafing underneath. So, you know, now we're looking underneath this aromatic sumac thicket, and it just shows you how open it is. Quail can move around under here. They're not going to worry about getting wet in the dew or anything, yet they still have the overhead protection. So that's what's important. We don't want thick grass growing under these thickets. We want nice open to allow for mobility within the thicket. Plums do great here in protected areas, but I've had trouble keeping plums in my diverse native grasslands. What other woody cover options are available? So maybe we have a unit and we're gonna 
apply fire every two or three years. So, you know, planting some plums is, is may not be an option. We're gonna have to protect them for a few years until they get established. They'll, they'll grow back after fire, but so maybe it's better if we just, we cut down some trees. We take the treetops, drag two or three treetops out there and make a little small cluster. We don't want a big brush pile. Big brush piles turn into possum and raccoon dens but a down tree structure. So what happens is that is a temporary um, woody cover situation in the short term, but in the long term, birds will perch on those dead limbs and they'll deposit seeds when they defecate. And those seeds, lots of times, will be various shrub species, so we'll get some development. The cattle can't get in there as well and, and trample that down. So, you know, after a few years, we have a thicket grow up where we drug those treetops out. Uh, another way is along the edges of grasslands. If we're limited on woody cover, we can do what's called edge feathering, where we just drop a few trees and the treetops have the same function. Um, so we can create some of that habitat if it's not where we need it. And we need it spread across the landscape in a, in a reasonable fashion. Quail aren't gonna fly 500 yards. So one thicket here and the next one being a quarter mile away is not adequate for quail. They need to be able to, you know, flush from danger and, and get to a thicket. So no more, they, you know, they suggest uh, no more than a couple hundred feet apart. But, you know, depends on the situation. At a minimum, I would argue, we need to have some type of escape cover, hard woody cover, probably every 100 to 200 yards at a minimum, um, if that's acceptable to the landowner. So areas like this can really be important for our winter habitat. Sure, you bet, because we're, we're meeting all their needs right here. We have appropriate woody cover for the winter, but we also have the appropriate herbaceous cover. This time of year, they're gonna be relying on seeds. I mean, once the frost has occurred and there's no more insects or invertebrates to eat, they have to eat seeds. So we're looking for all this diversity of, of broad leaves, and, and by seeds, you know, it's from forbs. Uh, most grass seeds don't provide much nutrition. So we have ragweed in here, um, desmodiums. We have all kinds of different plants here. Some of these legumes, so legumes produce a bigger seed than, than some other plants. Well, you get more um, bang for your bite, right? So if they can eat fewer seeds, it's less time they're exposed to danger. They can fill their crop and then they can go hide under a thicket and, and digest their food. So. Yeah, the, the sweetest species is in here. We've seen lead plant and sensitive briar and partridge pea. We have several legumes here that are critically important to quail in the wintertime. So Kyle, is there any way in our grazing management uh, that you see benefiting quail more in how we use these savanna restorations with our livestock? Oh, I think so. Historically, you know, this landscape was more open like this and, and grazing animals move through it. So I think it's still important to utilize it as a um, grazing unit. Um, fire is critical though in these environments. We can get away with only grazing in the grasslands. Um, fire is an important aspect for quail, but, but we can get away with only grazing if, if that's what we need to do. In here, we have to apply some level of fire because there's there's so much root stock from, from oaks trying to regenerate. Um, grazing alone won't cut it. But, but grazing in here is, is completely acceptable and I would argue a, um, a historical disturbance. It'll never produce the same tonnage as open grasslands will. You have a little more shade. Typically these sites are poor soils. So the stocking rate and the duration probably needs adjusted as to, as to grazing in the grasslands, but certainly I think grazing should be a component of, of this type of habitat. Yeah. So we, we do see our cool season grasses, uh, some of the wild rise really liking, uh, the sh not minding the shade mm -hmm. cover. Mm -hmm. 
and we find that these cool season grasses in our diversity you know are very important to being able to winter our cattle and to be able to make it through winter economically uh, without having to feed hay or as much input so uh, we kind of like these units uh, you know for uh, the cool season grasses that they can produce for us. You bet, and of course you even see a difference of a few different broadleaf species that'll, that'll grow better in here than out there that are con gonna produce different bugs and, and different seed sizes and types. I think, again, diversity is important. Any place we can diversify and habitat types and plant um, species diversity is important. Uh, I think diverse, the more diverse the entire landscape is the better for quail. So as this here unit has evolved for us, we've found that uh, we do have to have a certain comfort level with fire because we do have a lot of uh, woody plant material that just keeps wanting to come on. And it is that comfort with fire that, that lets us be comfortable managing this unit. Yeah, and we want some of that woody cover, right? Um, and it's important for quail. I would prefer shrubs because they don't necessarily ever get too tall, but even some of these regenerating oaks will function for quail to utilize, but only for so long. So if we don't have periodic fire to knock them back down, they get too tall and then they're no longer functioning for quail. So yeah, I think it's super important in this type of habitat type to apply fire on some basis, whatever it's needed to maintain this. You know, if this, if this graduated into 75% um, woody cover, well then we've lost the herbaceous uh, cover that we need for quail. And then our basal area gets too high and we have enough research from Oklahoma to show that occupancy of quail drifts, drifts out when basal area gets too high. So Kyle, how do we maximize quail on the landscape? So we need to think about overall um, usable space, right? So quail, the more we can maximize space and for a longer period of time, the more quail we can have. So if we manage, let's say we have a 100 acre unit and we're only gonna manage it with fire, okay? Well, if we burn the whole thing, now we have nowhere for birds to nest on the front half of nesting season, right? So best case, we burn half of it. I've already told you we need some type of disturbance in the last 12 months for broods to be very successful. That means half of it is available for nesting because it has residual cover and the half we burned is available for brood rearing. So for brood rearing, we would argue that's only 50% usable space. So we're not maximizing quail production in that situation. If we burn part of it and graze the whole thing or just graze the whole thing without burning a 100 acre unit, and if we graze it appropriately, now we've created the proper structure, and assuming we have the right plant types, across that whole unit. So we can have 100% usable space. Now we can maximize our quail in that environment. The same applies during winter time uh, with the woody cover component. If that unit where we're producing quail is great for nesting and brood rearing, but doesn't have the proper woody structure, either artificial or natural in the, in the form of thickets, um, then we won't have usable space in the winter. Those quail are gonna have to relocate. And in a lot of cases that happens, and that's okay, but we need to understand then we're not maximizing quail on those acres because now it's not usable for three, four, five months of the year. They have to relocate somewhere else. Anytime, if I take you out of your home and I put you somewhere you've never lived, that might be more dangerous for you. You don't know where to find food, you don't. So if we can keep them in smaller areas because we provide all their needs throughout as many months of the year, then that's more ideal. That's maximizing usable space over time. In the past, as a rancher, I felt like I need to manage for cattle at the expense of wildlife. But after talking with Kyle, I see how a healthy, diverse landscape is good for both cattle and quail. Managing for quail and cattle can make my operation more flexible. In dry years, when I need more forage, I can graze the grasses in my savanna areas a little harder, and in years with more rainfall, manage for a hotter burn to keep the savanna from becoming overgrown. 
Also, it's a natural taking steep, rough, or rocky areas of the farm and managing it for shrubby cover or edge feathering next to an open field. And we all have some overgrown areas of the farm, and now I see how I can manage those better for quail. Join us in the third video where Kyle talks about what prompted the research.